it's now 11 o'clock uh, here in Helsinki, and I think it's 10 o'clock in Brussels, so it is time to start our webinar. My name is Juha Jokela. I work as the uh, program director of the EU research program here at the Finnish Institute of International uh, Affairs, and it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all today's uh, uh, seminar where we, we, we will focus on EU's trade policy. We are very sorry for the last minute change of the timing of this event. Uh, this was because of the very busy agenda of our main speaker. And I hope that you accept our apologies for any, any inconvenience uh, for our participants. So here at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, um, uh, we are focusing on the changing global and political uh, uh, economic landscape shaped shaped by growing interdependencies, yet also increasing geopolitical and geoeconomic competition among the great powers. And against this background, we have also aimed to focus more on trade matters. And this spring, uh, our publications and events have already covered EU's trade policy. We have also published a working paper in Finnish on EU's trade policy. And today it's time to focus on EU's trade policy uh, more closely in this uh, webinar. This is a very topical uh, theme because of the ongoing review of the EU's trade policy. The Commission's proposal on a trade policy based on open strategic autonomy was published in February. And the continuously changing global environment and the introduction of the concept of strategic autonomy in EU's trade policy have led to a vivid discussion among the member states on the direction of the EU's trade policy. It is therefore a great, great pleasure for me to introduce to you today's speakers. Uh, we are very delighted to have with us here today uh, uh, Ignacio Garcia Bercero. Uh, he is a director of multilateral affairs strategy analysis and evaluation in the European Commission uh, DG uh, trade. And uh, Mr. Garcia Bereso uh, has a very, very extensive uh, uh, career uh, in the field of trade policy and also in the European Commission. I think you've been working for the Commission since uh, 1978. So you want to say that you. You have 1987, uh, correct me. <laughs> so one could say that you have seen almost uh, all of the trade policy discussions that we are here today uh, discussing. You have also been the chief negotiator uh, uh, in the free trade uh, agreements uh, between EU and Korea and EU India. So this is, of course, something uh, where you have worked very closely. And we are very much looking forward to your your intervention to the discussion. And after uh, Ignacio, we will have uh, Ilka Pekka Simila from the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Af uh, Affairs. Uh, he is the direct director general uh, in the Department for External Economic Relations. And he's been in that function since uh, 2017. And previously, has, he, has all, he has worked uh, as the head of the mission in Hanoi and the ambassador uh, in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. And he has also held uh, various positions throughout the Finnish uh, uh, representations uh, uh, in the world. And he has also very extensive uh, uh, experience in the external economic relations. And he has joined the foreign ministry in 1989. So, so there is a kind of a similar time frame here, I think with our two main speakers. After our main speakers, we will have two commentaries. Uh, I will introduce to the commentators uh, in due course. And after that, we also have time for discussion. I, and I would encourage all the participants of, of our webinar to pose your questions and comments to the chat function of this MST, MS Teams. And I will do my best to collect those and present them to, to the speakers of today's webinar. But without any further ado, I would now pass the uh, camera and microphone to our main speaker, Ignacio Garcia Bercero. The floor is now yours, please. 
No, thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to discuss here to, about European to Union to trade uh, policy. As you have already indicated in your presentation, after a public consultation, the European Commission to, has published the 18th of February uh, document, which intends to provide a strategic compass to how we see that European to, Union trade policy should be developed uh, over the next uh, decade. Our review of European Union trade policy has tried very much to place trade policy in the context of at least two very important uh, mega trends. One is the geopolitical tensions, which are linked to the conflict uh, between the United States and China. It's something which, of course, started during the Trump uh, administration but which all signals that it will continue and perhaps even intensified uh, in the current, uh, in the current uh, circumstances. And the others are very profound changes of the global uh, economy. Changes which in part are the consequence of technological developments, the growing importance of digitalization and the consequence that that is going to have for our societies and the competitiveness of our companies, but also the changes which are linked to the ambition in Europe and not only in Europe to make decisive steps to ensure that we have a climate neutral economy no, no later than 2050. All of these mega trends are going to have very, very profound uh, implications uh, on the European Union trade policy. And that's why we thought it was important uh, to place uh, this policy within the context of these mega trends and to identify how we could develop a trade policy that corresponds to this concept of open strategic autonomy. Now, I'm very pleased that as the title of this uh, uh, discussion, you have put the question, what is strategic about uh, the new European tra trade policy? And I, I'm very pleased about that uh, because normally all the debate is around the concept of openness and of, around the concept of autonomy. And there is less discussion about why we think that the trade policy that we are developing at this stage has a particular strategic significance. So what I would like to do in my presentation is to focus on that by looking particularly into three aspects of our trade policy communication. One is the focus on WTO reform as a central priority for European Union trade policy. Secondly, is the strong focus on the better integration between trade policy and European Union regulatory policies when it comes to digital and the green transition. And finally, why we identify Africa and other countries in Europe as being of particular priority at this point in time in terms of reinforcing the partnerships that are an integral part of European Union trade policy. So let me go first to the reasons why we put so much emphasis on the need to reform the WTO. What we are witnessing with the conflict between the US and China is a profound instability that can very much undermine the rule base which has been the foundation for trade policy globally over the last 30 years. And one could even say even before the creation of the WTO when we had the GATT system. We have been developing trade policy on the basis that we all could agree on a certain framework of rules and an enforcement mechanism for those rules. And that all key players in the system were ready to abide by those rules. This is no longer the case. I think that since uh, the last four years, the instability that has been uh, introduced into the system uh, by the conflict between the United States and China is very profound. And we believe that it's the particular responsibility of the European Union to work uh, with other countries to seek a profound reform about how the WTO functions with the fundamental objective of modernizing the rules of the game. We need to have rules which can manage better the interface between China as a state capitalist system and other economies which are more, more market-based. It is probably not realistic to expect that there will be a convergence of the systems, but you need to ensure that there is coexistence and that there is manage competition. And that's what we think is the fundamental objective that we want to achieve 
through a reform of the WTO, through a modernization of rules on critical issues relating to the level playing field, on critical issues relating to, to sustainability, on critical issues relating to the new realities of the digital economy. It's a challenge. It's going to be a challenge to find a way of agreeing to, with the United States and with China and with other key members how the rules of the game can be modernized. It is something on which we hope that we will be able to work constructively with the new U.S. administration. We have been hearing some good positive signals from the new U.S. administration about the need to work with allies to modernize the rules. But we also think that to a large extent is going to depend about the response of China. We don't want to isolate China. We don't believe in decoupling as being the, the overall approach for our the relationship with China. That's the reason why we concluded uh, uh, an agreement on investment uh, with, with, with China. But at the same time, for us, it's very clear the current uh, Chinese uh, practices are very distortive. They're having a the major impact on ensuring that there is a global, uh, that there is a global uh, playing field. And certainly, we think that it is perfectly proper to, uh, to find a way to modernize the rules to tackle competitive distortions. And that's what we are going to be uh, working intensively over the next uh, few years uh, to try to develop an alliance to modernize the WTO and also to restore a functioning dispute settlement system. This is critical because in the absence of, the, of an acceptable uh, dispute settlement system, there's a very, very high risk that uh, trade conflicts escalate, that they become major political conflicts. And the important function that until recently had been performed by WTO dispute settlement was to ensure that differences of view on trade could be managed and it would not escalate uh, into major political conflicts. And if we do not succeed uh, in achieving uh, this reform, I think that the risk of increasing tensions that could potentially have a destabilizing effect is going to be very big. So it is a tall order. I'm not uh, pretending that it is going to be simple. It is going to require changes in the way that the WTO functions as an institution. The WTO is going to have to accommodate much more plurilateral agreements because it's not going to be possible to imagine that all members of the WTO will be able to agree on the rules on this difficult challenge. But I think, in my view, the fundamental, fundamental question is whether China it is going to be ready to meaningfully engage and whether it is therefore going to be possible to agree with China on rules which ensure that there is a level playing field and that there is also a modernized framework for the digital economy. So this is, in my view, a fundamental strategic uh, uh, challenge where the European Union wants to place itself, where it wants to, to work uh, with allies, and where uh, we are going to be very, very much focusing on this as a central priority for European Union trade uh, policy. Now, second strategic challenge. Now, if you look into what is the source of European Union power, of European Union influence uh, on the global economy, I think that fundamentally it is because of the size and high degree of integration of our market, of the single market. That is our fundamental asset in terms of projecting externally our uh, influence. The European Union has developed a highly successful trade, trade policy in terms of concluding the ambitious trade agreements with many, many countries around the world. The European Union has had a huge influence in terms of regulation. I think in many important areas, the European Union has been developing regulatory models that have been then emulated elsewhere. But it would be a big, big mistake for the European Union to become too complacent on what is sometimes called the Brussels effect. Uh, as we are uh, entering into an era of important uh, regulatory challenges about the need to, to manage the transition towards a climate neutral economy, to ensure there is a proper regulation of the digital uh, economy, I think there are going to be many, many challenges in which the European Union is going to take regulatory initiatives, but we would need to develop a much more strategic policy of engagement, engagement with uh, like-minded countries to try to ensure that those changes are done in a manner which is guided uh, by the spirit of regulatory cooperation. So that's why in the context of this uh, new trade policy strategy, we put a lot of emphasis on the importance of, for the European Union to develop an active strategic 
holistic approach to regulatory cooperation, to work with like minded countries with a view to identify how our regulatory systems can be made more compatible and to be ready when we are developing important new regulatory initiatives to engage in dialogue with our trading partners. We are going to be taking over the next uh, year and beyond a number of very important initiatives, some of which can have significant impacts uh, on trade. There's going to be proposals for a border carbon adjustment measure. There's going to be proposals for a new legislation on corporate due diligence. Our regulation on artificial intelligence and other aspects of the, of the digital economy can have significant external impacts. And in all of those issues, the message from this communication is we cannot just simply regulate. We need to be able to engage in active dialogue with our key trading partners to see how we can actually try to ensure that our regulatory approaches are compatible and to try to enhance the cooperation to tackle the challenges that go way beyond, way beyond the European Union. So I think this more strategic relationship between trade policy and uh, our internal uh, regulatory policies, and also, by the way, industrial policy. It is something which I think is new in this uh, communication and which I think uh, reflects uh, a more strategic uh, mindset. Third, it is uh, the important element to mention is that the communication puts a particular emphasis on reinforcing our partnerships with Africa and with other countries uh, in, the, in the Europe. Now, if you look over the last uh, 15 years, the European Union has been quite successful in strengthening its trade linkages in countries in Asia. We have concluded a significant number of free trade agreements in Asia and also in countries in the Americas. Now, this is very positive and certainly there is no intention whatsoever to deflect attention from our trade linkage with Asia or where our trade linkage with the Americas. But it's also important that we look much more focused to what the countries which are closer to us and we see how we can strengthen our partnership with the countries in the Africa and with other countries in Europe which are not part of the European Union. And we see two fundamental elements on which we need to focus our attention. On the one hand, how to strengthen the regulatory partnerships with countries in Europe, but also regulatory cooperation with countries in Africa. And on the other hand, what we can do to foster sustainable investment with a view to ensure that those countries are as closely integrated as possible in the broader uh, value chain of the companies that are uh, operating in the European uh, market. So this uh, priority to be given to, to Africa and the other countries in Europe is again, in my view, a signal of this new uh, strategic uh, mindset, uh, which is reflected uh, in the new trade policy, trade policy communication. Although again, to make very clear, this in no way implies uh, less attention to other regions of the world. We have, of course, uh, some challenges ahead of us, like uh, the ratification of the very important agreement uh, that we have concluded uh, with Mercosur, which is very important economically, it is very important geopolitically, but at the same time it's a challenge because one thing which is very, very clear is that European Union trade policy needs to be sustainable. If there is not a clear indication that what we are doing in the trade policy field is consistent with our objectives in terms of climate neutrality, there will be no political support in the European Union for trade agreements. And that's a very, very important message. And that's why at this point in time, when it comes to the ratification of Mercosur, a particular challenge is going to be how to ensure that there are sufficiently strong commitments on the issue of deforestation, which is, of course, a very important uh, concern, not only in Europe, but also globally. And as I mentioned, we already have a good network uh, of trade agreements uh, in Asia. We are negotiating the, with other the countries uh, currently in Asia. And apart from the question of the negotiation of trade agreements, we see like-minded uh, countries in Asia have been particularly important uh, partners when it comes uh, to the development of our regulatory cooperation on issues relating to the digital economy or on issues relating to the green transition. And one final word about uh, the United States and China. I mean, obviously, we have strong common values with the United States. 
and we really hope that with the new Biden administration, we could go back to a different way of working closely together to base on the, a strong sense of partnership. We believe that the partnership with the United States is going to be critical for the success of our ambition to achieve a meaningful reform of the WTO. We also see significant scope for close cooperation to, with the new Biden administration on issues relating to, to uh, achieving the ambition of climate neutrality. And we also see a scope for better cooperation on digital. It is true that there are some differences on taxation issues and differences on the regulatory sphere. But we think that with the Biden administration, there's going to be a better scope uh, for, the, for the managing those differences. So we see potentially with us a good uh, pro prospect of a reinforced transatlantic partnership. And finally, a word uh, on China. Our relationship with China is multifaceted. We certainly have an interest on the cooperating the, with China in areas where we have common interests, like uh, combating the climate change. We also have an interest in ensuring that there's a level playing field uh, with China, and that implies also readiness to have economic engagement, which is the reason why we concluded uh, this uh, uh, comprehensive agreement on investment uh, to ensure a better level playing field for our companies. But at the same time, we are certainly not going to be in any way prevented from taking actions that we think are necessary in accordance with our value, values concerning the protection of human rights, concerning the fight against for labor. And we are not going to, to be in any way to prevented from to taking further action to defend autonomously, if needed, our economic interests in case of distortions of competition. The recent actions by the Chinese authorities, quite frankly, are creating a big cloud in the relationship would make it very difficult to see how we can proceed on the ratification of the CHI. And as we hope, therefore, that the Chinese authorities will be in a position to reconsider the, what there have been the, the decision that they have been taking recently. So I think I would leave it uh, as that and uh, very much looking forward to our, to our discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Garcia Percero. This was an excellent, uh, very broad overview, but also very, very, very clearly presented and also a lot of insightful views to the key topics that we are discussing here today. Uh, I'm sure that we can get back to many of those, uh, the, part, the strategic partnership with the US on trade and also on the question of the uh, value-based uh, trade policy. I think this is also something which has uh, resulted in quite lively debate uh, also in the member states. But now it's time to uh, give the floor for uh, Ilka Pekka Simila, uh, the Director General from the Department for External Economic Relations in the Finnish MFA. Ilka, please, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juha, and uh, thank you uh, for your invitation. It's, uh, it's good to be here and uh, Good morning to 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 everyone. Um, uh, of course, it's uh, always difficult to to say something smart after Ignatius' very comprehensive uh, introduction. But uh, but uh, I, I try to be also uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, strategic. Um, um, and to, to to start with, uh, uh, in terms of the the communication um, we of course very much uh, Finland support the communication and the content of the communication and and it's 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 key elements as as Ignacio uh, introduced um, and well um, as, as Ignacio mentioned um, you know the global trading environment uh, is, is uh, facing uh, many difficult challenges and the uh, European Union tries to answer to these challenges through this uh, uh, new uh, communi communication and uh, well I'm, I'm not uh, going to start uh, um, uh, introducing or explaining open strategic of autonomy but uh, but of course I mean f for Finland uh, as a an, an export driven country uh, uh, it would be, of course, at most important and vital that this uh, open strategic autonomy, I mean, 
uh, however uh, or whatever content or or how it evolves in the future so uh, it would not it would not lead to to protectionism and uh, and this this word open will be very much emphasized in this new uh, strategy um and uh, well as uh, as said i mean it's very strong focus on multilateral trade and also we give our full full support to that uh, policy line and as said i mean it will not be easy and and uh, there must be considerable considerable change uh, in 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 geneva at the WTO in terms of uh, uh, change in, in negotiating rhythm, attitude, positions among member states uh, so that uh, we would uh, get things back on track. Uh, but it's a, it's a tall order, but uh, but it's, it's, it's worth trying. And European Union has always been a very strong uh, supporter of the multilateral trading system and the WTO. Well, um, Doha round negotiations have been lingering for some 20 years already and and uh, for considerable time uh, in, in complete deadlock. Uh, so the question is of course, I mean, how, how we manage or how, how would, what would be the key to conclude somehow this un, unfinished business? Um, and also, uh, uh, as, as Ignathi also said, uh, uh, it's it's important to develop a, a WTO rule book uh, to to correspond the current uh, trade policy and environment. Uh, but clearly, as said, European Union and Finland is a strong supporter of multilateral trading system. But but of course, we cannot do it alone, and uh, we need uh, uh, key partners like the United States on board and uh, and and engaged. So also this focus on multilateral trading system and, and, and WTO, it's a, it's a clear shift in, in European Union's trade policy, one, one, one can say. I mean, trade policy which was dominated by bilateral and regional approach for, for some last 15 years or so. But of course, uh, we will not forget the uh, bilateral and, and the regional track and and uh, although um in the communication um, the focus is in in africa and in, in neighboring uh, countries uh, so i was i was very happy to 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 hear uh, uh, ignatius statement that we will is another deflection of attention on on, on for example asia and uh, the region of asia and and i, I fully share ignatius uh, um opinion on 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 the importance of concluding mercosur agreement uh, it's it's uh, strategic it's uh, geopolitical it's uh, very important in trade policy uh, terms uh, now uh, on 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 green and 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 promoting uh, green and and digi digital agenda of course it's also one of the key element in 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 uh, in the communication and uh, we, we see it very important to for example to facilitate the trade in climate friendly products and services technologies uh, and uh, and uh, in in that respect uh, i'm i'm very happy to 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 say and for your for your information i mean finland uh, uh, prepared a a proposal uh, uh, how to strengthen the inclusion of circular economy objectives into European Union free trade agreements. So, I mean, this was our contribution to, to discussion. And, um, and looking forward to, to continue this, this important uh, discussion. Now, in, in, in general, I mean, uh, clearly European Union trade and investment policy should contribute to, to reaching sustainable development goals and uh, and climate uh, goals uh, and uh, it's important to strengthen trade and sustainable development chapters in a way that they they they, uh, they have a positive impact on environment and also on human rights uh, including labor rights and also gender 
gender equality, but uh, in, in in the same way, um, it, it, we 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 need to we need to understand. We we need to realize that uh, um, that um, uh, we should not overburden the trade policy agenda with too many expectations. And uh, I think we need to realize also that we cannot achieve all our goals with the means of trade policy. Uh, indeed, trade policy is a powerful, powerful tool, uh, as Commission communication clearly says, and and uh, uh, therefore, I mean, uh, while while uh, um, understanding and uh, and and uh, realizing the linkages between trade policy and various other policy sectors, uh, uh, we need to take good care of the. This this powerful tool of trade policy and uh, and and not break it by 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 overusing and overburden it. And yes, Mr. Chairman, I th I think I'll I'll stop here and I'll I'll fully fully share the um, what what Ignacio said on 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 EU's US relations, EU's China relations. Uh, uh, both are clearly clearly important and crucial um, in, in the in the future and uh, and and um, this this will be also the question i mean how we would how we will design our future trade relations with these two important countries like us and china thank you very much thank you thank you ilka pekka similar for your remarks I find it very interesting your your uh, notion that, that there's a strengthening focus on multilateralism and WTO as a shift from from the previous years, as well as the uh, I would say the limits of of a trade policy, also in light of the the kind of the uh, promotion of EU's values. I think this is also very notable uh, 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 a kind of a, a observation related to the ongoing dis discussion of the EU's trade policy review. Now we have uh, uh, time for two comments uh, to, the, to the topic as well as the interventions that have been heard. So the first one is uh, Hanna Lauren. She works as the director of trade policy at the Confederation of Finnish Industries. And uh, Ms. Lauren has a, a, a very broad experience both from the public and private sector and you have also experienced uh, the work at the European Commission. So please, the floor is now yours. The view from the Finnish industries and businesses. Yes, thank you. Uh, as we Finns always got straight to the issue and I, I have a heavy duty on my shoulders to represent the companies. So I need to go to the what could be done better part quite soon. But I do have to say to soften the, the, the blow that the best official cyber permit are in DT competition and DT trade. And I do believe that when I speak about what could be done better for the trade review, I do direct my words mainly to the council. So <laughs> with this reservation, uh, I think the, the paper as such, when we first read it, there's not too much you can disagree with. But something is definitely missing, and I do completely share what uh, Ignacio and Ilka Pekka said about the world we live in. Of course, strategy should be done with a longer term view, but we cannot avoid, uh, avoid talking about the world as we see it now. Uh, and, and of course, we know the world economy is on its knees. Asia's economy has least of the hit, and the US short term stimulus is massive. Uh, since the financial crisis, trade barriers have risen steadily, even though Europe has done a good job on bilaterals to liberalize trade. However, globally, trade barriers are high as ever. And, and another trend that we've seen since the financial crisis is, of course, protectionism. Now, I would say the rise of state capitalism, even by open market economies. Uh, multilateralism, as, as uh, Ignacio nicely put it, is outdated, uh, should not be accepted as such. And last but not least, the European Union does not have a credible exit plan. Exit plan, I mean, from the situation, not just from COVID pandemic. 
what, what then could be done better with the trade review in the longer term? I think, and here I coincide with Ilka Pekka, uh, we need to define and limit the role of trade policy. If there is proof that EU's trade policy, say under Commissioner Malmström, has in any way contributed to social inequalities in the European Union, yes, that should be corrected. If European trade policy has contributed to climate change, that should be corrected. However, that evidence is missing. If European trade policy, policy is directly or indirectly responsible for human rights violations, yes. But trade policy is not the tool for everything. And what I'm afraid of as a young student of, of EU and international law, I do remember the competencies. And if we suffer of a lack of competence in foreign policy, trade policy cannot substitute that because trade policy per se has responsibility for trade and what trade can and cannot do. And I see that some political frustrations on social policy or foreign policy has turned eyes into trade policy as the exclusive competence of the European Union. That I think is not a trend we should support. Uh, second of all, uh, and, and this is here I coincide with Ignacio, is the better to better acknowledge the synergies between credible trade policy and functioning competition and industrial policy. However, I'm not sure if the unholy marriage between relaxing competition policy rules and demanding more autonomy for trade policy is a, a recipe for success. I do think that the EU's credibility in WTO and in bilateral negotiations has been its strict rules on state aid. And here I encourage Brussels to think how long the state aid rules can be laxed, talking about the extra, uh, how would I say, the, uh, the the circumstances related to the pandemic, because I do think it starts to eat credibility. And no, none of us, least the European taxpayers, will win when we resurrect companies that are not competitive and were not competitive prior to the pandemic. Then number three, I think we should avoid falling into the trap of the French autonomy. I think we would not suffer if the word autonomy would be taken away, although uh, it is good that Europe is looking for room to maneuver and taking its own decisions, but taken from the security policy, I think autonomy and what we've heard uh, it could be something that is not good for European credibility. Uh, fourth, I think, and this is my, my biggest pain, we should have much more emphasis on the importance of close bilateral trade partnerships. Europe has, or the Commission has credit to the Commission <laughs> negotiated great trade agreements. To my massive regret, many of those are still not ratified in the European end. Uh, my biggest pain that I always mention, even though not with a massive economic power, is with Central America. Over 10 years and Belgium still has not done the job I just checked. Uh, so we talk about enforcement, but we still lack ratification, implementation, and enforcement is, is sort of the stick but we need the carrot. We have close, deep trade partnerships that we should cherish and work with, and so the like-minded allies. And this, I think, is a really good basis also for multilateralism and reviving the WTO. Last but not, not least, and this is on the transatlantic trade where I really see there is a momentum now, but we need to swiftly move from the theology, the political declarations and handshakes, to the hard grind of transatlantic trade. And the Commission knows better than anyone what the hard issues are, and we need to compromise a little to find the middle way, because we cannot afford to be not aligned with our biggest trade partner on big issues such as climate change and digital economy. These are my uh, five points to success, so to say, and I um, hope to uh, provoke some, some discussion here. Thank you. So now it's time to give the floor to our senior research fellow here at FIA, uh, uh, Mr. Okko-Pekka Salmimies, 
he is actually uh, doing a visiting fellowship here uh, from the Finnish uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And before he joined FIA, he was the ambassador for Team Finland, uh, uh, a kind of a business promotion uh, activity and unit uh, in the Finnish uh, government administration. And he has also very extensive uh, background in multilateral uh, issues as well as trade questions. Among other things, he's been the uh, permanent representative and ambassador to the OECD and UNESCO in Paris. Okko Pekka, the floor is now yours, please. I wanted to say very much thanks for the previous speakers. And, and since it's a very uh, broad setting, wide range of, of issues that the commission is, is uh, covering, and I don't envy at all uh, the Commission's task, since it, it's a quite an, uh, let's say, one could even uh, call it as a mission impossible. We have 27 member states, and and they, they have different kind of uh, defensive and offensive trade in interests. We have several uh, number of of uh, policy sectors that have to be uh, coordinated with trade policy, and I have to say that uh, having heard. Uh, the comments of Ilka Pekka and also Hanna about what trade policy can do, where's the limit, and not to overburden trade policy. I understand this approach. At the same time, I also want to underline that it is nothing new that there's a strong interface between trade policy and other uh, policy sectors. Competition, environment, human rights, technology, security, these are very topical right now. But uh, it is nothing new. And let's not forget how difficult it has been to coordinate trade policy interests uh, with agricultural and internal market interests. Uh, but because these reasons uh, um, mentioned by earlier speakers, because of that, these links are becoming more visible and even dominant. And since it is, of course, extremely difficult to identify the whole of EU interest, which might differ from the whole of EU economic interest. And so we're in a, uh, like I said, the Commission is, is uh, the guardian of, of the EU uh, comprehensive interest. And now we have on the table a, a, a proposal for EU strategy, which, which is covering uh, many, many questions. Uh, I'd like to uh, focus on, on, on actually two issues that were mentioned also by the previous speakers. And the first is, is uh, the re relationship with uh, United States. Uh, we are seeing a very ambitious uh, agenda proposal for United States with a trade and technology uh, council, with regulatory cooperation, aiming at global standards on key technology issues. I, I really uh, think it's a promising message that Ignacio conveyed us that the first contacts with the Americans have been uh, positive ones. But uh, what is the plan B? Uh, if uh, with the United States there is not enough common ground or political will, what is the strategy of trade policy uh, in, of the EU for the coming years? And the other question, of course, is China. Also welcoming very much what Ignacio said, that uh, Commission, of course, is, is not trying to isolate China and, and not thinking about the possibilities, negative effects, uh, uh, developments of decoupling. However, also seeing the news flow of the current week, uh, we cannot exclude possibilities that the EU actions, trade-related actions, actually uh, have a negative impact to the EU-China relationship. My third point is about, and the last one is about the WTO reform. I think it would be, uh, let's say, unacceptable for the EU uh, at any point to say bye-bye for WTO or the multilateral system. I think it is a uh, chapeau for the Commission of taking this seriously, uh, trying to reform uh, the WTO, and based on EU values and interest. I think there's an inbuilt problem. I don't see that many uh, WTO members uh, welcoming the EU 
uh, approach and EU ideas of values as related to, let's say, uh, human rights or environment and climate issues. That doesn't mean that we should shy away of this interest, but as said, there is a limit probably uh, what the trade policy can contain as relates to other policy interests. So I'm very much looking for the uh, Q&A part. And uh, since uh, Ignacio, you very much underlined the WTO reform, I would like to hear a realistic, realistic uh, uh, evaluation from you. How is it possible that we can convince, including the African countries that you underlined on, on bilateral, uh, dimension. How can we convince our WTO partners that we should actually reform the WTO rules based on, on EU understanding of our values as relates to environmental protection, climate change and human rights? First, first I would like to uh, give the floor for Ignacio, because if you, you might have uh, uh, some ideas or you want to make you might want to make some comments on the basis of what you heard from the other speakers. Uh, I would just want to comment that I think one of the important the economy to be changed because of the pandemic to the phase of economic uh, recovery and to ensure that the policies for support uh, do not result uh, in competitive distortions. I would agree with Anna Loren that there is a big uh, risk of an increase uh, of the role of the state in the economy, not only China, of course, China is a master of state capitalism, but I think the tendency to have increasing the intervention of the state of the economy is going to be a general trend that is going to be present in many countries, including the, in the democratic countries in Europe and in the United States. And I think it's going to be really important to try to find a way of agreeing some ground rules to avoid that this results in a continuous uh, uh, risk of escalating trade conflicts. That's why one of the critical elements where we want to see a development of the rules uh, in the, the WTO on a prelateral basis, because it's not realistic to do it otherwise, but it needs to be done among the key, the key players in the global economy, are modernized rules uh, to deal uh, with subsidies, uh, modernize rules to deal with the issue of state-owned enterprises, and more generally to avoid that the state intervention in the economy results in competitive distortions. This is something that we had started working with the United States and Japan already under the, the prior to US president, and we hope that with the new Biden administration, we should be able to reinvigorate this work and to come forward with proposals, with ideas about how to try to ensure that while it is perfectly legitimate for the state to intervene in the economy, while it is legitimate to intervene to facilitate the climate transition, it should be done in a manner which does not generate competitive distortions. And that, I think, is going to be one of the fundamental challenges for the global trading system in the years, in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. I think we could now move on to the questions and answers session and discussion. I would now like to take up a, a couple of themes and topics which have emerged here and one uh, one very pertinent one raised by Okopeka as well, which relates to the value based trade policy. This has also been raised by in the question uh, uh, section of the teams by Sun Li Wei, the counselor of Embassy of China. Uh, uh, here in uh, Helsinki. And uh, Ignacio, if you would like to uh, comment on Okopekka's uh, uh, views on, on the limits of trade policy and the WT reform uh, in, promoting, uh, and in promoting EU's values related to human rights, uh, uh, also in terms of the uh, Green Deal, and the climate change and, and the digital agenda. Uh, it would be very nice to hear you view you what are the possibilities and and to what extent trade tools uh, can be used and should be used for this end and what might be the risks of 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 the value so the so-called risks of the more value-based trade policy please yes thank you and i would like uh, to clarify that if you actually look into our communication you will see that I think we're taking quite a balanced view about what can be done on the sustainability agenda, implying both environmental protection and labor rights, 
in the multilateral context, in the bilateral context, and autonomously. And I think you really need to look into these three elements set together. When it comes to the multilateral context, if you look into the ideas and proposals that we include in the annex on WTO reform attached to our communication, we are not suggesting that we should enter into renegotiation of WTO rules relating to the protection of the environment. We are not suggesting that we should undertake a major renegotiation of rules. We have very targeted ideas, which start by recognizing the importance for the WTO as an institution to recognize the importance of sustainable development in its three dimensions, environmental protection, social protection, and economic development, and to integrate this in a much more holistic manner into the vault of the WTO as an institution that promotes policy deliberation. We are also talking about uh, uh, interested countries, hopefully as many as possible, taking initiatives to liberalize trade on environmental goods and uh, services. We are talking about ensuring proper transparency about the different uh, initiatives which are being taken to achieve climate neutrality, including, by the way, transparency about the measures that the European Union itself is, intended, uh, is intending to take. So I think uh, what we are suggesting on this particular issue in the multilateral level, to, from my point of view, is very well reflected to take into account what is proper to be done in a multilateral institution where obviously you have many different uh, levels of development, many different uh, views. But we are all together on the idea that we should be able to promote the implementation of the sustainable development goals. And this needs to be more properly reflected in the work of the WTO as an institution. Now, when it comes, of course, uh, to what can be done to, uh, in the bilateral agreements that is different, all our recent uh, bilateral trade and investment agreements include uh, commitments on sustainability, both related to the core ILO conventions and to the Paris Agreement and other multilateral environmental agreements. And these are critical elements of our trade agreements. It is not possible to imagine that there will be political support in the European Union, which is a trade agreement that does not include uh, those sustainability elements. It would just simply not be understood by European uh, public opinion if those elements were not part and parcel of our bilateral trade agenda. There's a lot of debate about uh, what is the better way to implement and enforce those commitments, and we have opened a consultation on this matter. But I think any idea that we could actually imagine uh, a bilateral trade agreement uh, with a trading partner going through without these sustainability commitments, I think would be a total illusion. It's simply not going to happen, and it is critical for the political support for trade policy in the European Union. But at the same time, we have to be mindful. We cannot really expect that in a trade or an investment agreement, we are going to solve all the issues which arise in connection to human rights protection, which arise in connection to, with uh, uh, environmental challenges. And that's why we also need to look into what we should be doing rather through our own autonomous instruments. And I mentioned before the important pieces of European Union legislation, which are going to be discussed in the Council and the Parliament this year. There's going to be an initiative relating to a border carbon adjustment measure to tackle the problem of carbon leakage. There's going to be an initiative about how to combat deforestation, both domestically and imported deforestation. There's going to be an initiative to see how value chains uh, can be managed responsibly and avoiding the products which are connected with uh, breaches of human rights, labor rights, or environmental protection. But these are all autonomous instruments that will be developed by the European Union, where we would, however, be very, very mindful to ensure that what we are doing is consistent with our international commitments, including the WTO, and includes an important element of cooperation, because we cannot do this initiative without also having a dimension of cooperating with other, with other countries in the world. So I think you really need to look into what it is that we are seeking to achieve in the WTO, which I think is a modest but meaningful agenda of sustainability, what it is that is a part and parcel of our bilateral agreements, and what it is that is more to be developed through our own autonomous instruments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ignacio, for these uh, comments and views. 
And now I have had a request also from the member of the European Parliament, Mia Petra Kumpula Natri, to provide a very short and concise comment. I think your camera is now open, so if you would like to state your comment, please. Hello, I'm in the train, so let's see how it counts. I heard it. Uh, very nice to see you here in Dacia. Normally we see in the parliament. I'm in the intercommittee uh, since this term, and I'm in, in charge of the e-commerce negotiations. So I very much hope that we can start with something concrete before renewing the whole WT, uh, even that even this uh, got a little bit... Uh, by the company in that one, uh, and then I have been working on the flector and, and uh, on the green products. So it is very much uh, not discussed that often in Finland. I must know the country needs parliament to support any uh, uh, trade agreement uh, happening. But if I go to the question, it is this a very difficult. Uh, digitalization, a new eruption of the new kind of technologies. Last week in the parliament, we had a agreement, uh, we had a discussion in the plenary about the dual use, for example. And even there, we look at the uh, more human rights and how the technologies can be used wrong way uh, by the uh, state authorities or otherwise to really to these Mr. the possibilities of the uh, oppositions or how it was used in the Arab Spring and so. So I, I see very many steps that values has become the part of the EU trade policy. And I very much uh, hope that it will be seen that it is the case nowadays. It is not separate. I appreciate very much Hannah's speech, but here I see that it is very much linked. But if we talk about the technical sovereignty, also after the COVID that we are uh, very dependent on the digital infrastructures, uh, U.S. put it on the name of the uh, decoupling on some certain sectors. We have Bruegel uh, that analyzed the, which uh, sectors are critical. But then I also know that uh, China, Finland, uh, China, EU, others are doing a lot. But do we have maturity to look at the very concrete ways that these are necessary uh, without being uh, uh, protectionism, that this is necessary, as we do for the medical supply chains. Do we need to do something on the core? I read the U.S. Uh, strategy. It was the semiconductors, talent, attraction, very similar to that we have in EU when we try to be uh, competitive and not closed, but then strategically finding the way for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mia Petra Kumpula Natri. And uh, now we have some 15 minutes uh, still time left. And I think there are uh, plenty of comments and questions. And, and I, my task is now to try to collect those if that's OK for our speakers. And then I would pass the floor once more for you. And you can pick and choose and try to answer uh, those questions and comments that you feel uh, that you are confident in uh, answering. So the first question, what is in my uh, chat, box, uh, chat box, is from Saila Turtiainen. Uh, she also works here at the FIA now as a vis visiting senior uh, fellow. And she would be interested to hear more about the Commission's plans on the new anti-coercion instrument. In what type of situation would such instrument be used for? How does Finland see these plans? So this question is both for uh, Ignacio and, and potentially Ilka Pekka as well. Then uh, I'll, I'll have a look at the comments. There were also comments related to the uh, uh, climate uh, change already covered, but I would restate this once more if there is something else that our speakers would like to comment on that. How are climate change and mitigation and adaptation efforts visible in EU's trade policy? To what extent does is it, does it influence uh, trade agreements, for instance? So here we talk about the uh, bilateral fora as well. And I think the question posed by uh, Apo Pukarinen uh, was, was at least indirectly covered already, but I think there is an interesting element to it because we were, we were discussing about the value base of the trade policy and how it is potentially strengthening but here, uh, Alpa Bukharin also raised the question that whether whether this will, uh, so to say, fly, or whether in in a more longer term perspective, let's say next 15 years, we will uh, see uh, emerge of a more uh, he called it commercial 
realist type of actor in the EU's trade policy. So whether the values will stay or whether the EU will be forced to follow more uh, a realist uh, commercial policy, including uh, a trade policy. I think there is quite a lot of questions already, but perhaps for our uh, Finnish participants, uh, especially for Ilka Pekka and Hanna, I would perhaps like to bring in one question uh, or theme of the topics, because of course this open strategic autonomy is lively discussed now vis-a-vis uh, -vis trade policy. And that's why we also have the, the question that what is actually the strategic element of the trade policy, because there's been quite a bit of discussion on the openness of EU's trade policy. And of course, one element what has changed in the Union is that the UK is not anymore in the EU's decision making when the trade policy is, is, is discussed. Of course, we now see the US, UK's integrated review and we see that there is a strong emphasis also on the open uh, trade policies. But within the EU, uh, I would like to ask our Finnish participants, uh, do you think that the, the, the kind of the dividing line between the, uh, the, the, the liberalist uh, uh, within the EU and then the others, perhaps highlighting more protectionist, uh, protectionist uh, trade policy is relevant at the moment and, and who might have taken the UK's role as the torch carrier of the of the free market or liberal uh, trade policy. Uh, this is something that we've been discussing here at, at HIA, and, and we've been wondering whether that is, for instance, Sweden. And in relation to that, of course, Finland has been on this liberal camp. Uh, but of course, it's relevant to ask also when the EU's trade re review is ongoing, whether there are any changes in Finland's approach to the EU's trade policy. So with these uh, several questions, I would now like to pass the floor again to our excellent speakers. And perhaps we go with the reversed order, so Ignacio will get the final word. So I would now start with Okopek, if you want to comment the questions or provide some further views. Yes, Juha, thank you. Um, I think it's a uh, very interesting question about the like-minded uh, grouping. Um, it, it is a, a reality that if we're talking about a union of 27, that one needs to uh, align oneself with those who sympathize your own interest. I think we might also see a, a quite a um, positive development that we're not ganging up against each other. We're talking about real what is the most important issue strategically uh, and how we can uh, see if, if it's being supported by other member states. I think, I, I'm not sure, I'm very looking forward to hear what Ilka Pekka and Hanna will say, but I think in the current constellation, Finland also needs to consider when it comes to technologies, when it comes to values, when it comes to climate policy, who are the strategic partners for us and it not, does not necessarily follow the old uh, liberalist, so-called protectionist camps, but you need to you need to partner yourself uh, based on on ad hoc ad hoc interest, and then you, of course you need to convince the partners that this is not only good for for an individual country, but this is the whole of EU interest. But uh, I would uh, like to leave it to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oko Pekka. And then I would give the floor for Anna Lauren. Yes, I think the liberal part in this review is the open part. Uh, but I think going back in history, since the end of uh, trade with the ex-Soviet Union, and especially in 1990s, Finnish companies won't take any examples, had to make themselves competitive. They never could rely on trading in internal market and then later on to Western open economies on <laughs> the heavy hand of the state. So I think it is natural only that we believe that our company is giving a clear footing, the same uh, rules to compete can do their jobs. Uh, and in this, of course, we always look at the, the Nordic partners and, and the Baltic partners, but here the north-south divide is not true. I, I look to Spain, Portugal, Ireland. I think we could be a little more creative here and majority of the EU states 
by their nature actually do not benefit from protectionism. Shorter term, some longer term, none. So I believe that the reason will win in this. With one sentence, I'd like to comment to the question on, on climate change, because I do believe that trade can positively and has to positively com contribute, but and also that EU, US and like-minded partners could find a mechanism to put price on carbon. The current model that the EU has been tooting, which is the um, CBAM, so to say, the carbon burden adjustment, does not seem to be the ideal fit. But still, it is a good question. And also, uh, value chains, shorter they are, uh, you know, less they produce carbon, therefore home shoring production away from where the raw material is might not be the answer to a low carbon trade. With these words, I pass to Ilka Pekka. Thank you, Hanna. And now Ilka Pekka Simila. Yes, uh, thank you very much. It's a very candid question, and uh, I would I would hesitate to 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 divide uh, EU member states, uh, my, my colleagues, to, to different camps. But uh, and I, it's it's actually not that uh, uh, black and white. I, I, sh I should say to start with. Um, because I think um, throughout the European Union member states, um, we I think we all we do agree the importance of multilateral trading system and uh, and 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 uh, I mean trade liberalisation as such. Uh, but then of course there are nuances. Um, um, for example, uh, how we would uh, open our own markets. Uh, um, when it comes to, for example, sensitive products in, in agriculture and so on. So this um, <clears throat> sort of division between North and South, I mean, uh, as, as uh, Han and Oki also said, it's, it's not that, that evident uh, uh, anymore. For example, Mercosur agreement, um, uh, Portu Portugal and Spain uh, has been very supportive to that agreement, and 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 you know uh, they are considered. Some are, have considered them to belong to the southern camp, and uh, and and then we have, for example, issues like uh, well, it comes technology, um, digital data flow. So uh, there also you can see a different uh, so-called like-minded uh, groups. Uh, so it's it's all it's actually becoming more and more issue based uh, um, uh, grouping of of member states and uh, and uh, so issue by issue and then you you form coalitions and you find find partners and uh, and and well of course this UK element as you said you are it's uh, uh, clearly I mean UK UK was a cornerstone of this uh, so-called uh, northern liberal camp and and uh, um, um, I'm, I'm not sure I mean which or who will take the leading role uh, if if there is a sort of situation or if this is the sort of starting point that you would need a a, a clear leader in, in, in liberal camp uh, based on what I just uh, just said thank you and yes, also there was the question of of uh, <clears throat> uh, of Saila Turtian and on anti-coercion instrument. Uh, well, I also I hesitate to, <laughs> to to take any stand. I mean, the same goes with the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Let's let's just wait uh, what the Commission produces, and let, then we will then we will give our say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilka Pekka. And now it's uh, time for Ignacio to enter the discussion once more. Th thank you very much. And I can also be perhaps prudent when it comes to the anti coercion instrument because we are in the process of developing the, an impact assessment. Uh, we are therefore undertaking the consultations uh, with a view to identify what is the way, best way forward. The fundamental problem that we are trying to address is that the European Union needs to have the tools to defend itself in case that it is subject to coercive action contrary to public international law. 
and that the tools uh, for response should be effective, should be rapid, but should always be consistent uh, with our uh, international uh, commitments. And that's what the anti-coercion instrument uh, it is intended to do. I would say that this is being developed very much with the aim that it should have more than anything a deterrent effect that hopefully would not need uh, to be used. But unfortunately, we have been experiencing uh, cases in the past in which we have been subject uh, to clear coercive action to try to get the European Union or the member states to change the policies that they have the sovereign right uh, to decide, uh, uh, to, decide uh, to, to follow. So that's uh, what we are looking into, and there will be a uh, legislative proposal towards the end of the of the year. Now, when it comes to the issue of value-based vis-a-vis a realist trade policy, I think it's a little bit of an artificial discussion, quite frankly. I mean, what it is that we mean when we are talking about value-based? Now, if you look into something like climate change, this is not just an issue of values. It's a fundamental uh, challenge uh, for the survival of uh, the European Union and the global community. It is something that is going to have huge economic impact across all economic activities in the European Union. And to imagine that you could develop a trade policy in a splendid isolation from your aims to achieve climate neutrality in the European economy, I think is an illusion. You need to, however, to, to be sure that the tools that you develop are efficient. And of course, fundamentally, it's not trade policy tools. Trade policy tools can only have a supportive role, and it's going to be other instruments that will play the key role in ensure that we have a decarbonized European economy. Now, when you are looking into digital regulation, I will very much agree with the comment uh, that was made that you cannot really isolate digital regulation from issues relating to values, from issues relating to the protection of human rights. I mean, privacy is at the core of the European Union to regulation of the digital economy. If you are going to regulate artificial intelligence, you are going to have to look uh, into issues which are connected to ethical concerns, human rights. So the idea that in those sectors you can regulate uh, in abstraction uh, from values is a bit uh, illusory in my view. So what you need to see is how you establish the proper balance, how you integrate those elements properly into your, uh, into your trade policy. But values inevitably are connected to European trade policy and climate change inevitably is going to have an impact on all European Union policies, including, of course, uh, trade, uh, trade policy. So I think I will leave it there mm -hmm. and I will not comment on the position of different member states. My experience having worked in the European Commission for almost 30 years, most of this time on European trade policy, is that at the end of the day, there's always a balance in the European Union, which is a balance which supports open policies, with compromises, with sensitivities, but the overall balance is always one which supports open trade policies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ignacio, also for your final words for our webinar. And now it's quarter past 12, so it's time to conclude this uh, webinar. It's been a great, great pleasure to moderate this session. It's been a great, great pleasure to hear your uh, expert uh, analyses, views, also uh, points raised in this discussion. I also want to thank, uh, uh, besides all the speakers, our very active audience. There were plenty of questions and and I think those were answered by our, by our excellent speakers. Uh, there is not much time to think about takeaways from this uh, webinar, but I think what, I, what is uh, safe to conclude is that there are very high expectations related to the EU's trade policy. And I think these uh, expectations in relation to the ambition and what can be achieved by trade policy is also a very pertinent question. I also find it very interesting the discussion between the discussion about uh, the trade policy being a kind of a nexus of internal and external uh, governance of the EU. And of course, this is something where uh, a lot of uh, 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 adjustments and also, also integration needs to take place uh, to reflect the single market and the policies of the EU externally. And also, it was very interesting to kind of touch upon the topic about the political dynamics, although very briefly, and, and how the UK might have changed it or not. I think it was also interesting to have a view from the European Parliament, as well as then the national governments and the Commission. And I think this, pro this provides us a picture of how the EU formulates its policies. 
So there is the Commission proposing that there are member states as well as the European Parliament, the kind of the co-legislature and also interest groups and the civil society actively engaged. So I'd be, I'm very happy about this discussion and I hope that we have opened up uh, 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 this uh, difficult question of trade policy for our audiences. And I once more thank everybody who has been participating today and wish you a very uh, good uh, noon. It's actually lunchtime here in Helsinki, so so uh, I hope to see you in our event in due course, and I hope that you can follow our publications also related to trade. Thank you very much, and have a pleasant day.